All right. Welcome to another installment of our online Bible study. This time we have been talking about the ways with, Je- with which Jesus dealt with interruptions. And the idea is in our lives, maybe we have a plan, maybe we have a, an idea of how things should go. And, and all of a sudden something comes along that changes that plan in some way. And how do we deal with that? Ultimately, we're talking about change and openness to new things and how does God lead and the sovereignty of God, whether or not those interruptions are meant for our good or whether we believe that something bad is happening and all of those kinds of situations. And so what we talked about last week to kind of introduce the situation was Jesus interrupting the lives of his disciples. And we see, we saw in looking at one passage of scripture how there were disciples who were ready for that. Uh, Simon Peter fishing and, and he put his net out on the other side and got such a large take of fish. And then we saw the Pharisees who then grumbled at, oh, this guy's eating with sinners. He's eating with tax collectors. He's eating with all these people. They obviously were the ones who were not open to be interrupted. And so the, the question is maybe Jesus, in, in planning his ministry opportunities and in choosing his disciples, picked people who were, were already open to, to change, uh, picked people who were already willing to be interrupted in some way, shape, or form, people who were looking for something else or more. And so maybe we should think about our own hearts and our own lives, whether we're open to Jesus interrupting our lives to do something phenomenal through us, if Jesus were planning a new wave of ministry. And and maybe the, 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 the person we are now is not prepared for that, right? Maybe the person we are now is not strong enough for that. Maybe the person that we are now doesn't have the right mindset for that. What what those interruptions mean then is that we become ready uh, to to deal with more. Maybe that we become. Maybe that we go through a process of transformation, continually to let God build in us something. Maybe we open ourselves to new opportunities, to learn something new or be something new. And then to 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 take it a step further, then we look at how Jesus uh, dealt with interruptions. And, and we'll talk about one of those stories today. And, and he uses the opportunity because people, um, uh, his disciples, for, for example, are not open to the interruption he is. And it teaches us about our perspective and what's important. So I want to dive into the book of, of Mark chapter 10. And what we're going to do is just read a handful of verses. And these handful of verses are going to kind of tell us a story. But to get the full idea of the story, usually what we have to do in the Bible is see the context of the story. What, what stories came right before it? What stories come right after it, maybe? Uh, to get an idea of what Jesus is teaching. Because there's usually there's a, something we can get out of what Jesus said. But if we see the context, we see a, a little more depth. And we see that in this passage, chapter 10, verse uh, 13, for example. We see this idea that, that Jesus is out and about. He's teaching. He's going about his business. And in verse 13, they were bringing children to him that he might touch them and the disciples rebuked them. So what we see is Jesus is interacting with people. A lot of the parents um, who are sick themselves are, are coming to be touched by Jesus. He's healing people. But a lot of the parents say, well, you know, there's there's the, the touch um, of Jesus was thought to bring two things. Healing, uh, the woman who just said, I want to touch the hem of his garment and she was healed. But then also blessing. Uh, and that's something that, that would have been an understanding back then. A, a, t- a touch conveyed blessing. Uh, the touch of the, the, the patriarchs upon their children was, you know, they would touch them, lay their hands on, lay the hands on in the Bible is a, a sign of blessing anyway. So they would bring their children and say, hey, touch my child, bless my child. You know, maybe there were some that were, were sick. And the disciples would have none of it. Okay, they, Jesus had a plan. They were going to stick to Jesus's plan. Now there are, I think, in this world, planned people and not planned people, <laughs> spontaneous people, not spontaneous people. I tend to not be spontaneous, and I have to remind myself that if I have a plan, there might be an interruption throughout the day that that makes my life better, makes the day better, or it's more important than the things that I had uh, planned for that day. And so the disciples, it says, even they may rebuke them. Uh, you know, these parents coming to receive a blessing from Jesus. We'll put that in perspective in a minute. But what we see is verse 14, when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. This, what I understand from having read on this is the word indignant there is used of Jesus at one time, and this is it, okay, indignant. He was angry, he was mad at them, he was, he was furious. Because according to him, he wanted to bring the children to him and they didn't want that. And so he's saying, listen, there are things more important than the plan. And disciples were missing the point. So he got angry at him. And he says this, let the children come to me. 
and do not hinder them, for such belong for to such belong the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom like a child does not enter it. And he took them in his arms and he blessed them, right? Which is what we were saying, and he laid hands on them, right? Laying hands on was a conveyance of blessing and healing. Uh, perhaps these were not the ones who needed healing and they needed the blessing. And so, okay, well, uh, the disciples to be sure to be forgiven because where else did he mention letting kids come to him? Well, so, so we're reading in chapter 10 of Mark. Uh, should we go back to chapter 9? Should we go back to one of the last verses? Verse 42. And what does he say? He's talking about little children. If anybody causes one of these little children uh, who believe in me to sin, it'd be better for him to have a great millstone hung around his neck and thrown into the sea. So what he's saying is children are important. Uh, during that society, time in society, children weren't thought of as, as, as important. You know, today, I'll give you an example of that, right? So t- today, uh, you get to a potluck meal at church, right? And a lot of the parents bring their children up to the front and feed the kids first. Uh, that wasn't done necessarily when I was a kid. The, the adults went through and then the kids kind of made their way, right? So that we, we prioritize a little bit more. We, we think of the needs of the kids a little bit more. And I'm not saying that they weren't respected and endeared. Obviously, Jesus did. But, but women and children both were kind of a go last situation in that situation. And so what Jesus is saying is, no, wait a minute, the children are important. They have, not only are they important because they are who they are, Jesus created them, they're, they're, they're made in the image of God, but they're important because they teach us a lesson. And, and what, what the lesson is, is that when children come to something, they come with hands open to receive. When adults come to something, and, and this is the example of the interruption that we talked about last week, the disciples came with open hands, and they were full of faith, and they accepted. Jesus said, follow me, and they said, okay, let's go. The Pharisees were the example of those who came with hands full of their own traditions, of their own thoughts, of their own power, of their own prestige, and they were not willing to accept something new. So he said, unless you enter as a little child, which is full of faith, acceptance, understanding that something new can be good and and take it in that way, then you'll not enter the kingdom of God. So he's teaching us something using that interruption, but but it goes deeper than that. Um, And so, but, but it is important to understand that the children matter and that he wants everybody to know that the children matter, that they have something to teach us and that we should value those who in many ways in shape and form are not considered at the highest. So we're talking about women and children. If you go to the verses we just read, 13, 14, 15, 16, are in the middle of the chapter. If you go to the beginning of the chapter, so we went a little bit to chapter nine and and he's already talking about children. So the, the disciples should have had that on their minds. But then at the beginning of chapter 10, what's he talking about? Um, What are the issues that come up? One of the issues that comes up in chapter 10 at the beginning is somebody asked Jesus a loaded question, right? Why why do people ask uh, people in power, people searching for political office, why do they ask them a loaded question? Well, they know it'll be hard to answer. And so what they do is they, they're, they're heading around the region and somebody comes up and says, uh, it's a Pharisee, so it's a kind of a trick question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And so, okay, pastor, you're getting into a loaded area yourself. There's landmines out there. Let me begin by saying uh, I'm not a judge of people and I understand uh, that, uh, you know, there's, I understand that there's not judgment in me for those who might be divorced and remarried. Having said that, uh, let's look and see what the Bible says about it and why that's important. And and what we're trying to get out of this is not judgment. It's not uh, picking on people. It's not any of that. So please hear me out, okay? If if you're listening to this and, and you're remarried, so just, you know, un- understand I'm not coming from a place of, of judgment. It's not my place. It's not it's not what I'm interested in. I understand that, that there are difficult relationships and, and that that's a difficult thing, Okay. But but understand from Jesus' teaching point of view, if you go back, uh, the, there were vows that were important, the vows that the people take with their God. And then one of the best teaching tools that God had was to form relationships down here that taught us about the relationships up there. In other words, earthly things, many times in the Bible, were designed to teach us about heavenly things. Physical things were designed to teach us about spiritual things. So there are earthly realities that have heavenly and spiritual components about that. When we're talking about the Old Testament covenant, the New Testament covenant, the vow between uh, Moses, uh, you know, uh, Abraham, all of the ones that God made vows to, you be my people and I'll be your God. 
the Bible set up a covenant as a very important thing. Now, the marriage is in a covenant. And what God says is, listen, if you take your vows uh, not so seriously with things on earth, you're not going to take my vow to you seriously. And you're you're going to have a more difficult time understanding the, the commitment that I have for you if commitment doesn't mean something great. And so the Pharisees understand that this is a difficult issue because why is it difficult? Well, if you read the story, Moses allowed for divorce. Moses allowed for people to file a certificate of divorce. And it was a recognition that while the biblical ideal is wonderful, it's, it's, it's difficult. Okay. And it's not to try to lower God's standard, although, you know, it's, it's, uh, in such a little bit of a way, Jesus is saying, yeah, that lowered the standard. But, but Moses recognized. Uh, the difficulty of it. I recognize the difficulty of it. Jesus, in some way, recognized the difficulty of it. But what he says is, uh, he, he talks to the Pharisees and he says, okay, well, you know, you asked me whether marriage is lawful. What did Moses say? Well, Moses allowed for a certificate of divorce, they say. And Jesus made this comment. He said, well, Moses did that because of the hardness of your heart. Okay. Ouch. Jesus, thank you for that, right? But look at the question involved. If, if we look at the vow God made for us and we look for ways to try to honor that, the question would not be, is it lawful for us to find a way out? And, and Jesus acknowledged that in Moses setting up the law, Moses allowed for, for a certificate of divorce to find a way out of that. Maybe the question would be, if we're trying to honor God and trying to follow our vows for God and, and honoring every other vow as if it could teach us about that and be a symbol of that and make our lives easier in following that vow, the question, instead of saying, is it lawful for us to leave, would be, God, how do we stay? God, what can you say to convince us? What can you say to help us make it easier? What can you say that will make it easier for us to stay together instead of finding a way out? So they asked the wrong question, right? Whether we're open to interruptions is really about what the questions are that we're, we're asking. And I'll, I'll use divorce as, as, an, as an illustration. And again, don't, don't hear judgment in my heart. Uh, reality is reality, and Jesus admitted that, and Moses admitted that, and everybody did. God set a high standard. It's a difficult standard to, to keep. Uh, we, all, we all understand that. But in trying to keep it, right, in, we're looking for ways to do it, not looking for ways to not do it. So if somebody comes to me and says, uh, Pastor, you know, I, I need a way out. Maybe, maybe their hands are closed with the answer they think they want, right? And, and they're not going to be able to be helped. But if somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, we're struggling. Pastor, we're, we're talking about what might happen if this relationship doesn't last. Are there things you can do to help? Is a wholly different question. It's a, it's a question of open hands rather than closed hands, okay? So if I go to the store, right? I went to the store a while back and I thought, I'm not getting that much stuff, so I'm not, I don't need a buggy, I don't need a cart, I don't need one of those uh, things you carry around. Uh, all I need is to put my hands, okay? So I got some things and I had this and I had that. And I thought, oh man, I forgot this. And you walk through a grocery store, right? And it's a little maze intended to keep you there for a long period of time. And the mood, mood music is soothing and you can't see the windows out the door, right? There's a psychology of keeping you in a grocery store for a long time and walking by things that they'll know that you'll want. And they put those on the end caps and they put those right in front at eye level and the things that are healthier they put elsewhere, Right. You walk around, you need more things. At some point, I got so much in my hands, I can't carry another thing. So I have, I have I, options. I could go back and get a cart like I should have in the first place. <laughs> or I could put something back if I want something new. Then I have to prioritize. But I have to be willing to let go of something that I'm already holding on to. It's a tremendously difficult thing. If our minds are made up to let that go to bring in something new. If we think things should be going a certain way, it's very difficult to let that go. And what Jesus said is, are you not open to be interrupted? Little children are. 
My disciples are, for various reasons. Levi had his reasons. Simon Peter had his reasons. But they weren't so close. The Pharisees were asking the wrong questions. Their minds were made up. They had an idea of what the thing should be. And they weren't going to let anything else in. And so all of the, all of the, the Gospels are an illustration. People who were open, people who were not open. People who were willing to be interrupted, people who weren't. And, and then so you question, have to get to a place where you're, you're f- free to question the things that you, your priorities that you have. Uh, they said, oh, Jesus keeping a schedule is a priority. Jesus said, no, children are the priority. <laughs> if we're interrupted by children and you cause them to sin, we're going to hang a millstone around your neck and go sit, find the closest lake. That's pretty important. My schedule, if I'm running late for lunch, that's not the end of the world. You with a millstone around your neck (laughs) and the bottom of a lake is the end of the world for you, right? And so stop and say, wait a minute, there's an interruption. First of all, we have to admit, I don't like interruptions. I don't necessarily like change. Some people do for the sake of change and there's times I do. Drive a car long enough, you want another car. Some people do, some people don't. Some people say, well, you know, I've only had this car 20 years. I still had a few years in it. Some people said, I've already had this car for 20 months. It's ready to get a new one. So you gotta figure out which kind of person you are. But if you're the kind who doesn't like change, but it's divine interruption, not a regular interruption, a divine interruption, can we stop and breathe and say, okay, God, align my priorities. What are you trying to teach me? Where are we going from here? What's next? Right? Because all of those things are important. So he, he's teaching about covenants. He's teaching about uh, honoring uh, people in society. You know, if you, if you don't honor the female and you just cast her away and sign that certificate of divorce, he's saying no way to honor each other. Honor the children. And it's, it's his respect. He's teaching about uh, all of those things. All right. So then right after this, bring the children to me. And in the verse we read, 16, I uh, took them in his arms, blessed them, saying, then the, the story of the rich young ruler. Right, the rich young man came up, he was setting out on his journey, he calls him good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, oh, keep all of the the, the, the um, uh, commandments. And the guy said, I did all of those, and they list them off. And Jesus said, okay, one more thing, you know, give away everything you have. And the rich young man went away sorrowful because he had so much. Okay, what, what is he teaching us? Jesus is saying that in order to be interrupted, to find what's important, the children here are important, honoring our relationships, honoring the least of these, allowing God to interrupt our lives, allowing Jesus to come along and say, follow me, and, and dropping everything, right? There are those whose hands are so full, right? This guy was wealthy. You could be wealthy with any number of things. That hadn't been that long ago that we used this uh, passage on Sunday morning. You could be wealthy with family and friends and with all of these things, whatever it is that you don't want to let go of might keep you from a supreme blessing. Might keep you from being used in a way that you can't see now. Might keep you from being transformed in a way that God can do something extravagant, extraordinary through you. I'll say again, right, the blessings in in the Bible, most of those were meant not to be a blessing to the person, but to be a blessing that would flow through the person. God blessed Abraham that he might be a blessing to the world. Uh, I believe that that holds true for us, but he can't bless us if our hands are so full of whatever's in our lives right now that that we can't imagine change might be good. So I'm I'm hoping that this is begin. We're beginning to see that there's a preparation to be interrupted. A lot of times, if we're not ready for an interruption, God might just skip right past. Right? He didn't call any Pharisees to to follow him, right? Because what he probably knew they would say no. He says at different times he knew their hearts what they were thinking before they said it, right? The disciples, follow me. Not a hesitation. Okay. (laughs) Hold on. (laughs) Throw my nets down. Done with that. Let's go. Right? What, what, What would God call us to leave behind to grab onto something new? What are we clinching so much that if God were to call us something new, we wouldn't be able to let go of that? So some thoughts to think about. We'll pick this up again next week. Uh, Until then, I hope that you're doing well. I hope that you're enjoying this series and learning something and evaluating some things in your life and priorities and such. But more than that, I hope that God will use these uh, times of study to to, um, open you up to himself in new ways. Until I see you again, God bless you.